Hey, this is Chef Jim Thompson from Orlando, Florida. I'm with SMO Table, and you're here with the Eat Y'all podcast. Hey, this is Patrick Horn in Birmingham, Alabama, and you're listening to the Eat Y'all podcast. Welcome to the Eat Y'all podcast, where we discuss the struggles and successes of the farmers, food producers, and chefs who are working to get better ingredients into restaurants today and to ensure their availability in the future. This episode of the Eat Y'all podcast is made possible by a partnership between Alabama Gulf Seafood and Gulf Shores and Orange Beach Tourism. Check out the show notes to find links to the people and places mentioned in this episode. Thanks for listening to the Eat Y'all podcast. This is the third of four episodes from the Alabama Seafood Chef Camp held in Gulf Shores, Alabama. And we're visiting today with Jim Thompson and Patrick Horn. These guys knew each other before Chef Camp. Actually, Patrick introduced me to Jim, as things happen in the chef world so many times. But uh, Jim is going to tell you about his operation down there in Orlando, Florida. And Patrick is the chef at sous chef at Automatic Seafood in Birmingham, Alabama. So an Alabama boy knows a lot about seafood, serves a lot of seafood. And uh, we're going to jump right into that episode right now with Jim Thompson and Patrick Horn. We're here at Chef Camp. We've got two amazing chefs. The Jim, I'm going to get you to introduce the chef with you. And then I'm going to let Patrick introduce the chef. Well, I am here with Chef Patrick Horn. He was my sous chef and then executive chef at Satterfield's restaurant in Cabo Heights. What is state is Cabo Heights in? Alabama. Cabo Heights is in Birmingham, Alabama. Because our listeners are worldwide. Just, you know, <laughs> I'm so sorry, not everybody's bad. in Alabama. Yeah, okay. we're down here in in Birmingham specifically. He is now working at Automatic Seafood with Chef Adam Evans. Evans, that's right. He was he's been a good friend of mine for coming up on almost a decade now. He's taught me so much of what I know and taught me that I really don't like Auburn fans. Hey, look, this is an SEC friendly podcast, so we can hate like I, you know, I'm not a huge Ole Miss fan. So <laughs> it's okay. I'm an it's, Alabama fan. We get tons of hate. <laughs> roll Tide. Roll Tide. Yeah. How about Jimbo Fish? Yeah, uh, we'll hey, get to, we'll hey, get to hey, that hey. in a little bit. All right. So now, Patrick, we're going to put the shoe on the other foot. Who's this guy to my left, your right? This is weird to say, but Chef Jimbo Thompson, man, he's, <laughs> he's a greenhorn that I trained way back in the day and he has blossomed brilliantly. Uh, over the years, he has come to make me rethink my education and to he's he's done so well. It's surprising. I'm jealous of him. He knows more than I do sometimes. But that's that's not the thing. You know, we all learn from each other. So he was, you know, a line cook at Satterfields and we we groomed him. And then I wanted him to be my shoe chef at Satterfields and things didn't work out. So. So I'm I'm devastated at that. But anyways, <laughs> and look, we're that, we'll this, have a few minutes to just silently cry if we need to. This dude, so, is, this dude's my boy. So, and you know, here, we'll always be here's what I love about what happened here because you guys we know about Satterfields because of a cat named Haller McGee who was roommates mm-hmm. with a guy named Andy Cook that went to Ole Miss, who was a chef at a place called the Parker House when I was doing food blogging in 2009. Andy introduced me to Haller, who got me connected to some other people who eventually I met Brittany because we were doing a pastry chef thing. And then mm-hmm. Brittany, when I was talking to her about what we're doing here, she's like, you need to meet my buddy, Pat. And then she never mentioned you, Jim. Uh, that's, that's okay. But then Pat's <laughs> like, yeah, I got a guy. And so it's kind of like this this link of chain that the culinary brotherhood and y'all may have never heard of Andy Cook. He and there's it's some Howler story. stories and they're probably not all perfect for this podcast. But uh, Andy Cook's a big part of the reason why I do what I'm doing, because he drugged me in the back of his restaurant. I would go there to eat a steak dinner and 15 minutes in, I'm actually standing back there turning steaks and he's explaining <laughs> how he makes the sauce and and I'm standing there in a the suit coat turning steaks. So it kind of, you know, it all this whole thing, that was one of the first things I ever learned was, you know, he's like pressing on them and teaching me. This is what it feels like. This is what it feels mm-hmm. like to do it right. 
Anyhow, it's great to have you guys here. We're in Gulf Shores, Alabama. You guys have spent two days, and I don't even know really where to start because the zoo was wild. We went to, I don't know, it seems like five restaurants yesterday, <laughs> multiple seafood places today. We saw crabs. We saw tonged oysters. We saw farmed oysters. We saw shrimp processors. We saw a shrimp boat. I feel like I'm missing something. Went to the oyster farm. Oyster farm. Which, that was really, really cool. I was oddly tired yesterday and weirdly tired today, but we didn't do anything. It was more more mental tired. You were soaking up a lot of information. We and were hitting you great. with everything we that's had. That's what I need because I'm old and <laughs> <laughs> he is not old. All right, so I, I need to. I'm, I'm, you know, when I was 18, I was like, I don't want to learn this. Looking at books, I would rather work with my hands. And now here I am working with my hands, and I like, I need to work with my brain. And so here I'm working with my brain, and I'm appreciative of it. So it's been a really nice break. Yeah, I have like several hobbies now and, you know, I go in and out of like learning about cooking and I get inspired. And that's why I chose to do this, the chef camp It's I needed to be inspired about cooking again. I get burned out two to three times every couple of years and it's unfortunate, but people, we go through it, you know, yeah. chefs, we go through it, especially as physical as it is, it burns you out. And so you need to do something that breaks you out of that. And seeing the way things are harvested, even things like zoos, you know, it kind of is it's relaxing. But at the same time, you know, you get to, it's on the coast, so it's kind of related. So you get to see how they run their restaurant there. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting. So I'm thankful for the invitation to do this. So I want to go back. So. You, how old are you, Patrick? I'm 38. 38. I'm 32. 32. So you guys are kind of not the complete ne- generation behind me, but you're not the 26 year olds either that are starting to kind of get mm-hmm. your feet grounded, but you're not 45, 55 in the industry. I want to, I want to go back to your first bite of seafood, your first seafood memory you ever had as a kid or, you know, I interviewed somebody earlier today, his first seafood memory, because he grew up in Kentucky, was when he was 19 in the Coast Guard in uh, Puerto Rico. So what's your first, like, I remember this seafood shrimp cocktail on vacation, whatever it was. Fried frog legs in New Orleans. What restaurant? Oh, God. I mean, I, I was... Eight years old. I, I cannot tell you. We went to a fry house with my family and I was not a huge seafood person yet. I'll go ahead and throw that out there. However, my dad convinced me to eat a whole basket of fried frog legs by saying they were chicken wings. Oh, yeah. And I devoured them. I loved it and pitched a fit afterwards. But ever since then, it wasn't but, I think, nine months later that I had oysters. And after that, it was You were just loose. game on. Oh, yeah. A- anything and everything. But that that's my first, like, big memory, specifically of seafood. Frog legs in New Orleans. What you got, Pat? I remember popcorn shrimp at uh, a place down here in Gulf Shores. I can't remember which. I mean, we went to so many different restaurants, but Frog Legs was another one of those. There's a place in Hoover called Captain Hooks Oh, on Lona Road. Really? Way back in the day, probably 30. It had to be almost 35 years ago. But in the little shopping center right there at the four-way in Lorna Road. But yet, uh, they convinced me that it was chicken. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> but, at least I'm not alone, man. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, popcorn shrimp. That was my thing was popcorn shrimp when I was way little kid. That's funny. That is a great gateway drug because it's like, well, you like popcorn, mm-hmm. you know, and then you like popcorn shrimp. It's like, oh, well, it's like popcorn, but it's meaty. So I could, I could totally see that being. Oh, a, yeah. And it's perfect for kids, too. I remember. So I have family who are, live in Hattiesburg and I was going to see them. And we lived like three and a half hours north of there in Starkville, which 
when you lived landlocked by four and a half hours, seafood and growing up poor, like Poe, we were, we grew up Poe. There was, there was never seafood because it was like, no, you eat whatever's in the circle around you that you can get from either growing yourself or the grocery right. store and in quantities that can feed seven kids. Seafood was number on that list. So I go see my cousins that lived in Hattiesburg, which is like, they, they drove the hour down to the coast from there all the time. And they're like, Hey, we're going to, they were excited to have me there. And they're like, we're going to get shrimp. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. You know, the first whiff of the seafoody smell. I mean, we had bass in our pond and you know mm-hmm. whatever and brim and catfish that we would have, but it was not to me, it wasn't seafood. It was pond food. But, I remember going, uh, uh-uh. uh, I'm, I think I lied and said I was allergic or something and I refused to eat the shrimp. And they're like, Joe, let's just try one. And I was like, okay. And literally I remember having a, like, this was so new and different and I didn't try new and different things at 12 years old or whatever old I was. So it was really funny when I was thinking about this podcast and asking people about seafood members, like, what is mine? And it was that, that shrimp that now, I mean, I have, my kids, we've eaten thousands of dollars worth of cocktail mm-hmm. shrimp on vacation. It seems like just, oh, there's only six of them. Have another. Right. Have just another. keep bringing them. Yeah. And uh, next thing you know, you're like, okay, we should have just bought a bottle of Dom Perignon because we just spent that on shrimp. All right. So, Patrick, you're an automatic seafood. Yeah. Give our, our listeners a little bit of a like seafood restaurant. What it, what does that look like in in your part of the world? Is this like... Fine dining? Is it like the shrimp basket? And, you know, where do we stand? Do we describe it? The best way I can describe uh, automatic seafood is upscale casual. We do prepare dishes that are very, you know, intricate and fine dining and well thought out. And we do have the dishes that are, you know, the whole flounder, you know, fried whole Mm. with, you know, Walk roasted vegetables or, you know, right now it's farm, you know, farm bok choy that's, you know, plancha, seared on the plancha with a Hunan sauce, which is kind of like a Chinese, you know, spicy soy sauce. So there's a broad spectrum. Do you have microgreens in the freezer there? Oh, and they walk in there? No, or no you, microgreens, so but we do have very, we pick our own herbs. But it's like plate, like you're plating food. It's not... I mean, it's not not that, you know, the shrimp basket doesn't plate food, but everything is cooked to order. Yeah. So it's, you know, there's fast pickup times. Uh, well, you know, in the chef world, we call pickup times, you know, it's like within six or seven minutes. So when something is fired within six or seven minutes, it's plated. So, you know, but, you know, barring something crazy happens on a Friday or Saturday night, it could take longer than that. Yeah. But that's just that's that's normal. Yeah. With a place our size. So how, how many seats do you have? I'm not, don't quote me on this. Don't be mad at me, Adam or Suzanne. But I want to say that we have, if everybody is in one seat, a little over 180. Okay. So in that 150, 200 range. So you, you've you got some. But we we can do two and a half turns on a Friday night and touch 300 f- covers. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. And that's if everybody gets you know, their hot meal. Right. Which is, you know, what everybody strives for. So I want to say it's it's probably the busiest restaurant in Birmingham right now. Wow. Well, it's definitely on my list of places to go. It's painful, but it's so much fun. Yeah. I love working there. It's definitely been challenging physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, if that's, if that's yeah, possible. Yeah, I think but, that's... You know, I staged with Adam... Or I didn't stage, actually. I dined at Optimist in 2013 with my now wife. We were dating at the time, and I was like, I'm going to work under this guy. I know I am. I got to. And here I am. I'm working under him, and I love it. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so, Jim, what sorts of seafoods are your favorite seafoods to cook? Oysters. Oysters. Hands down. Uh, I've done the whole fish. That's really a lot of fun when you can get whole fish in, but that can be hit or miss getting it in depending on how far inland you are. Oysters can be a little bit more readily available. And honest to God, I love throwing them on a wood fire. That 
grilled oysters on a wood fire, a hickory fire is my favorite thing to do. Okay, I, I, I'll just sit there all night. Yeah. There's something magical about, like, the oyster juice is hitting the fire, the mm-hmm. the parm and the butter and whatever else, goodness, no, bacon, whatever bacon else people fat, have thrown in all, there. I mean, you, you can dress them up every which way you want, you know? And it's just like, it creates not just the dish that you visually see, but there's this this whole aroma kind of melding of this kind and this kind, the Rockefellers and the blue cheese. And like when all of that is m- just thrown into the, the vena hood or whatever it is, and then kind of disperses across the restaurants. Well, a lot of times I'll do them, um, you know, smaller parties or even, you know, larger weddings. And the weddings have always been a lot of fun because it when, when you get a wood fire out and you start grilling oysters, people congregate and yeah. it creates an atmosphere and it's just so much fun to feed off of that, you know, and yeah. you're just sitting there well, throwing oysters. Cause it's people. sort of a performance art at that oh, point. 100%. Too. And yeah. you get people talking and it's just, you kind of get great. In a, you kind of get in a rhythm of, you know, fire these. Oh, you just start slinging these, oysters. Fire you, know, these. You, you don't even think about it anymore. It's as fast as you can get them out. You do. And sure enough, and give them about 30, 45 minutes. They'll all be gone. Yeah. And you probably have no hair on the back of your knuckles. If no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any feeling in your fingers. <laughs> you don't need it anyways. Yeah. No, no, it's, no. It is completely useless. But uh, I, I noticed the first time I helped at an oyster competition, we were cooking them. I was like, I don't think I have any hair left from like <laughs> midway down. <laughs> yeah, I think it added to the flavor, honestly. I'm not going to lie. All right. So things are in the restaurant. So I told you guys, I was like, we're going to be part Dr. Phil part Ron White on this. So, you know, I do have a box of tissues and we also have beverages depending on which direction (laughs) we need to go here. But okay. So I think everybody knows that, you know, it's 2021. There's ships that have lots and lots of things circling in parts of the country where they can't quite get unloaded fast enough. Some of those things should have come to your restaurant by now, like to go containers or, you know, various, whether it's plastic or some ingredients that come from or something that goes to a farm that then becomes part of a something else. So there's kind of a lot of different things that have, you know, I've heard chefs say, hey, we can't get this or we can't get that. And, you know, some of that is from importing. Some of that is just, you know, effects trickled down from COVID or whatever. But what, if anything, has kind of been tricky for you guys in this economy recently that's like, well, it's hard to get this or if this has gone through the roof and a year, year and a half ago, right at the beginning of COVID crab skyrocketed. I'm sure we've all heard that, right? You know, that everything went from, you know, $25 up to, you know, 40, $50. Sometimes you see it at a pound. I was doing weddings and crab, you know, eight ounce crab cakes for 250 people. Right. Right. So you start doing the math. It's cheaper to do lobster Hmm. at that point. Yeah. One hundred percent. You know, that was one of the things about that. Yeah. Like it, (laughs) it was a weird swap to do. Yeah. Especially down here in the South, you know, because we're just so used to, you know, Gulf crab. That that was the first thing that that really hit me. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you say that because one of the places we visited was a crab processor that was like, so for about five weeks, we completely shut down. Yeah. And, and so they, and they do a ton. Mm -hmm. Found that surprising. They must own the building. Yeah. They have to, because for the, you know, if you're paying rent on that, I don't know. I mean, it all depends. One of the things they did, and this is again, kind of their little ecosystem they buy it by the pound from the guys that are fishing and they pay the people who processed it by, out by the pound. So they kind of had, they didn't have just a crazy amount of fixed overhead, just all this labor sitting around doing nothing or whatever. Right. So it was kind of like, well, we don't have anything to process. But I can tell you, they were pretty excited to be back cranking out the crab. Everything looked like it was in full swing today. That was really cool to see. Uh, that room was full, chock yeah. full. yeah. I can't remember how many pounds they said they were doing like 5,000 pounds or something today. Seems like a lot of crab. If you think about it. what, what do those tubs have? A, is that those a, are one pound tubs. One pound tubs. Yeah. yeah. So that was, uh, that was quite a bit of crab coming through. 
Pat, has anything been tricky uh, economically for you guys? Because I know Jim's Jim's kind of been the in the personal private chef catering like special event world more so than you've got menus and hundreds of people coming in every day that if you change something and they come in every week and it, you're like, oh, well, this now is a dollar more. Well, when it was first off, beginning of 2020 was we were running, you know, all to goes and there became a large clamshell, you know, three compartment clamshell shortage. So a couple of restaurants around the town were loaning and, you know, borrowing from others and doing that. And then as recently it was, it's right now we're, we're out of stock on certain sugar packets and medium to go boxes, you know, clamshell kind of things, you know, for our, our app, you know, appetizer side of the menu for to goes. And we're still not doing that heavy of to go. So it's not that big of a burden, but there's a few things here and there. Like right now, there's a thing called 7-Eleven and it's a stabilizer for egg whites or other things. And we used to use it for our meringue on top of our, you know, trademark key lime pie uh, on the menu. And we have still yet to see that in stock. Wow. So right now we're just doing a normal Swiss style meringue, you know, where you're drizzling in a simple syrup, whipping it at high speed, and then just throwing it in a piping bag with a star tip. And then just, you know, piping each, you know, portion of pie and then torching it with the propane torch that we light the grill with earlier at four yeah. thirty in the afternoon. We did light the grill a little we early. Just Hope that I, I propane, had to bring a torch. I knew we needed a torch. Yeah. <laughs> we just hope that propane it lives in my car. You know, yeah. the camping propane tanks don't gotta go out of style because Hey, those are important things. We need those. You're Chef's best friend. Go to Walmart and get them. They're twelve dollars for four. <laughs> for four? It's like twelve seventy eight mm-hmm. for four four pack. Wow. You can if you go to Home up. Depot, it's like nine dollars for two. I've heard you can Sorry, light cigars Depot, with those. But, but uh, Oh yeah, they're great. I mean, you need to get one lit you're good all right so most i guess memorable thing from you know we saw a lot of things today you guys kind of mentioned the oyster farm some of the crab stuff what has anything changed as far as your perception on well i used to think this about the seafood industry i realize it's really hard to get you know i don't know for me looking at the jumbo lump crab meat i don't think about how much work it is to pick a crab and then you're watching those ladies in there, and there were—I think there were a couple of dudes in there too. But that was that was specialized intense. skills, yeah. It, you know, and that was one of the things that they really emphasized, and by talking to us and telling us about was that these people are not just your run-of-the-mill labor force. You know, these are people that have been doing this for 30, 40 years at this point. Their families have been doing this. It's it's a generational thing at this point, and it's it's passed down. Not anybody can just come in here. You know, even us chefs that think our skills in the kitchen are better yeah. than par, typically, we get so shown up if we walked in there and, and tried to pick crab or shuck oysters next to these guys. Oh, man. But the oysters? Absolutely. Like, they would... Walk us out of the park, <laughs> dude. Those somebody, one of y'all, describe walking your thought walking in to Anna's oysters and hearing the banging. I mean, it sounds like, like gunshots what, from outside. What were you thinking? Like, what what did you think was about to happen when we walked in there? I didn't hear anything past those curtains, but then you walk through those thick vinyl curtains, and it's like chop, 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 chop. And it's not even in rhythm. It's I look down and there's there's two rows of back to back, you know, essentially conveyor belt rolling down the middle, yeah, right? A conveyor Poorly belt down sized the cubicles. Right. Not even <laughs> not even, you know, no pictures of the families on the wall, no computers, no keyboards, but it's like it's a a round solid steel peg that they're banging these oysters on with a hammer. And then they also have a knife and then a basket, some of the guys. But, you know, what was really surprising was that some of the, each different culture 
whether it be Asian, Latino, American, or others, like they had their own style of mm-hmm. shucking. Yeah, they did. And each, you know, some of them used the hammer to bang on the the knuckle. Right. Is that the is that the correct term? I, I think so. The heel. The hinge, the hinge, the hinge, yeah, the hinge, yeah. the hinge in the, the the oyster, and then used the outside, the wide, you know, U shaped edge, and g- went in with his knife, and then would scrape the adductor on both sides, pull it open, and then you know, throw the oyster into his his bucket of ice. Yeah. And this is all in the span of like. About a second and a half. What, what's... The dude was so quick. It was amazing. <laughs> the guy on the very end on the oh, right man. side. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And he, he knew it. So he knew it. As soon as we all walked in, they all I, sped up, too. Like, I tried it was to see insane. If had, I tried to see if he had ear pods in to see if he, he because was, he was in a he rhythm. Kept, yeah, he oh, kept thought he was listening to forth. music. There yeah, I think he was a, chasing himself on time. You know? There was a definite rhythm to these folks mm-hmm. that was just crazy. So she told us in the other room that they actually make those hammers. They get the hammers made for them. It's not something you buy out of a catalog. They have a, a I mean, they're all the boat people that are doing right, all this right, stuff. Right. So they, they manufacture those hammers and uh, that's part of you know how all the you know all that was built but the little the little pedestal that's like the size of a deck of cards mm-hmm. that they use and the little stools that people sit on so it's all right there and this was you know for our listeners they're harvesting big tongued oysters throwing them in buckets weighing them rinsing them and making gallon oysters and it was Honestly, I've done a lot of these seafood tours down here. I'd never seen that, and it blew my mind. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to learn new things every time I do this. Well, yeah, and you walk into this very assuming, unassuming, small yeah. white brick house. You know, it, it looks like a residential house for the most part, except it's got a big conveyor belt shooting out the side next to a dump truck full of oyster shells. But you would never think before you walked in there that, they're cranking out, you know, they, they were saying, what, 300 sacks of oysters a day? Something like it was, I don't know like, what the number crazy. was. Yeah. I mean, well, so I asked her, they sent oysters for our dinner. I asked her, hey, are you guys on Instagram or anything? And she said, no, we, we're just word of mouth. And they're as busy as they want to be. I mean, she was saying trucks are there at 4 a.m., and it's really cool because I think I wow. we we I, sometimes forget like this little town by Alabatra, Alabama, is one of the largest seafood towns in America, but definitely on the Gulf Coast. I mean, they're cranking out so much. I mean, stuff comes from from Louisiana, Texas, shrimp from all over. Yeah, they and said they just, were running back all the way down from Key West and all the way up into the Carolinas. Yeah, like golly. And that's all through the Alabama economy. Yeah, we do a lot of our grilled oysters, and we take pride in whatever we put on our menu. Our raw oysters come from, you know, certain companies. And as we put those, whenever they're available to us, of course, they're specialty oysters. They, They are literally perfect every time. They're essentially the perfect size for throwing on the grill with our, you know, seasoned butter sauce, and we will put them on our grilled oysters. And we sell out of them every night. And Mm. I'm not kidding about that. We literally do, it's five per order, six if they request. And then, yes, we do upcharge for that. So the oyster companies do get their money. But we literally sell about four sheet trays a night, and that's about 35 to 40 orders. And that's five to six per order. We do insane amount of grilled oysters as well as raw oysters. It's. Do you have a wood fired grill or you? We have a wood fired grill. Yeah, hickory grill. That's what that's what Jim was saying. The magic magic sauce right Mm -hmm. there. Uh, This guy's the the whole reason I know how to grill. Uh, uh, Back at Satterfields, we had a wood fired J and R grill, Mm. big old cast iron. Pat was the the grill master, the grill chef up there. And then I came along, he threw me on it, and I never left. And I loved it. Ever since then, I've been 
to been at two other restaurants that both have JNRs. And I love it. Yeah, having a, a hickory wood fire inside of a restaurant, I think I don't think you can replace anything like that. I do love a little throw throw in a little pecan here and there, gonna give it a little oh, yeah. little sweetness. I mean, you can play around with, with all sorts of wood, but by having that wood fire. Yeah. That's, and I think the wood fire kind of sings like it's it's a voice in the in the restaurant that the customers are like it starts them craving something they don't even mm-hmm. know is happening when they walk in and they get a little Get a little whiff of that. It's like the guy smoking a cigar across the room, and you're like, "Huh, that smells good." Well, you put a fire campfire out. Every male <laughs> they gravitate. Oh yeah, we're just gonna go straight to it. It's in our blood. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Did you know that 30 million pounds of fresh seafood are caught off the stunning 53 mile coast of Alabama each year? Alabama Gulf Seafood and Gulf Shores Orange Beach Tourism recently hosted the Eat Y'all Chef Camp, where this episode was recorded. To learn more about Alabama Gulf Seafood, visit eatalabamaseafood.com. And to plan your next culinary beach adventure, visit gulfshores.com. All right, we're going to transition into the lightning round. There are uh, no dumb answers, but there, well, well, there are. But (laughs) uh, we're going to start, I'm going to start with you, Jim. Biscuits or cornbread? Biscuits. All right, Patrick. Ah. He's really thinking about this. <laughs> you, it's a hard question. It's a really there's difficult that question. That was the easy one. No, come right, on. So there's two different styles of biscuits. There's so many different styles of cornbread, I think. So I think you can – I'm going to go with biscuits. I'm a big fan of biscuits. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> we passed. <laughs> All right, so you can continue. Yeah. The uh, the guy with cuffs is still downstairs. If <laughs> you get too wrong <laughs> – he puts you in the back of it. I think we're I think we're good okay. with him. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we've passed. I think it. he's he's nice and fat bellied. He's, he's good. <laughs> yeah, you guys paid him off in uh, in something no man can refuse. Good cooking. All right. So favorite po boy. All right. I'm gonna do a shout out to Rougarou in Birmingham. They have a oysters Rockefeller po boy. Ooh. That with big old bacon lardons, oh my god, it is hands down the best boy I have I've ever had. Dude, I kind of feel like a fool. I haven't had many po boys. I I kind of go for other sandwiches or burgers. Un- unfortunately, I don't trust the way some other people and establishments treat their seafood. I don't know if you need to edit that. <laughs> <laughs> But well, and roast today beef is at still Lighthouse yeah, Restaurant, yeah. today at Lighthouse yeah. Restaurant, the half and half, I got seafood and crawfish. It was delicious. So I'm going to go with Lighthouse. There you go. The seafood crawfish. That, it's, that's exactly My shrimp po' boy was to epic. D- now, I, I was sitting beside Ernie, the shrimp guy from um, Graham Shrimp. And I said, Ernie, do they buy your shrimp? And he said, no. They told me they buy from a friend of his. He said, you don't get anybody to change unless somebody really <laughs> screws up or you go deep on the price to make it worth it. He's like, and they hadn't screwed up in years. So there's got to be a story there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ernie's, Ernie's got lots of great stories. We got to get him on the podcast, but uh, he wasn't able to join he's, us tonight. He, he's told so many good stories. It was so hard to hear 10 feet outside of his circle, but he had so many great stories. So whenever he was talking, I've made sure to, to listen to him. Yeah, he kind of gave his version of the tour, even at his buddy's shrimp place. Well, he even, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, he even started joking on the other guys. And like, you yeah. know, what was this, Dominic from Dominic, Dominic yeah. Food? Yeah. He yeah, was clowning on him a little bit. He was at Dominic's look, dock in Dominic's place, you know, picking on him. They look thick as thieves, those yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> well, and Dominic's, Dominic's telling us about the doubloons that his father found. Yeah, the pirate. Pirate Pirate gold. Gold. Yeah. We need to do a whole podcast on that and probably uncover like who stole it and where it is now because <laughs> I feel like we could solve that crime. I'm moving down here and, and we're looking for gold. And I think it's Spanish to bloom. I don't. I feel like I looked that up one time because I thought I had one, but it was just a replica. It was supposed to be worth like sixteen thousand dollars or something. So anyhow, okay. Favorite shrimp dish? Anything you can come up with? I mean, this is this is where you channel your inner Bubba Gump. This is gonna be this is gonna be embarrassing, but straight up popcorn shrimp. I, I will sit there and devour pounds of popcorn shrimp and be the fattest, happiest little kid. 
There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, Patrick's thinking about it again. Oh, man. It's the reason why I, I think I don't, I'm not allergic to shrimp. It's because my parents exposed me to shrimp when I was so little. So I've seen so many shrimp dishes in my life. You know, I've seen everything from popcorn shrimp at Red Lobster on up to, you know, you know, shrimp done right at places like Highlands Bar and Grill in Bottega and, you know, doing the Royal Reds at, you know, mm-hmm. Automatic. But I'm going to settle with... It's hard to compete with Royal Reds, man. Straight you know, up. I mean, we've done the... Do, I, do you remember that... I'm not saying this is my favorite, but do you remember that shrimp ceviche that mm-hmm. we did with fried green tomatoes oh, yeah, and crab yeah. uh, at Satterfields? That was a good one. It was a mixture. It was a weird mixture of the hot fried p- tomatoes, but the cold shrimp and crab it really ceviche. All goes together. Yeah, but because you've got the acid from the from the green tomato, tomatoes. Yeah, dish. yeah. Oh, it was good. Yeah, I think it's nostalgic. It's just kind of going to the you know coconut shrimp or fried mm-hmm. shrimp when I was a kid. I had some. Well, we had some coconut shrimp yesterday. Can't can't pinpoint it's, it, but but good. those that would be the one. All right, so we we got a couple more, and we're gonna wrap you guys up. Thanks for sticking with us and uh, i don't even know what time it is but it's yeah it's after my bedtime it doesn't (laughs) matter we're still at chef camp we're rocking out here all right so favorite beverage to celebrate you're you're going to celebrate an occasion what's your what's your go-to beverage well i I quit drinking so right now i I really don't think anything can be a glass bottle grape co there you go cold on ice straight out of the freezer you know just it is so good especially in birmingham i mean it's it's what i grew up on you know yeah there's only a handful of places you can get a glass bottle grape goat out there and for me it depends it's you know at the end of a hard night at automatic it's a good hot you know miller high life champagne of beers <laughs> but if you want to do super you know extravagant you know, something that you just pull out of the cellar, a glass of Krug, mm-hmm. champagne, you know, actual legitimate. From the region. Yeah. Champagne is Krug, good stuff, or a good just hearty bourbon from Kentucky. Also another favorite of mine. All mm-hmm. right. So uh, you guys, we've we've kind of talked a little bit about your careers, but one year from tonight, you're going to celebrate – something that you've accomplished that you're November 2022. What are you, what are you celebrating a year from now? Honestly, let's, let's hope for the purchase of a couple of acres of land and a decent, you know, a decent size, but not too huge house in somewhere, Alabama with my wife and I, we've been looking for trying to get out of Birmingham for a little bit and, Get some some land and do. I kind of want to do the farming yeah. thing. That'd but be big. That'd be big. That's that's a big move in a year. So I mean, a year from now, you gotta have a kid too. You know, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you putting that juju no, on him? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's good luck. I mean, you know, could be. No, you'd be a great dad. I yeah. believe so. I'd love to see you as a dad. We're trying. <laughs> All right, but, so, yeah, Jim. One year from now. <laughs> Honestly, the first thing that comes to head, the first week of November, that'll be two years sober. That's awesome. That, that'll be a, a big one for me. I just I just had that first year, which was cool. Yeah, but, that's awesome. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do on that note, I do want to say I know that this is a this is a very tough industry. There's a lot of tough industries out there. Oh, yeah. But I think, you know, a lot of chefs and a lot of people think about that and and wonder, can I do it, or is it worth it, or what am I giving up? What are I missing out on? Since you're kind of on that milestone and looking forward, what is that? What does that meant for you? Straight up, in the first six months, I lost about forty pounds. Wow! Just to put it into perspective, how much healthier I feel now. Yeah, I mean that's no BS. I literally, you know, I quit drinking, I lost a bunch of weight, and I feel so much better. What about your mental sharpness? Oh, I'm there. 
I'm a lot more aware of myself, my own psyche, my own choices, the career path I want to have, you know, the, the stuff you think about never used to think about where, what am I going to be doing in five years? Really? You know, it's, I used to just sit there, go to work, grind, drink, come home, drink a little bit more, go to sleep and get up and grind. You know, as chefs, we all have to get to where we're at somehow. And that's oh, for a lot of people a grind. And I get that, but it can be really unhealthy and yeah. it doesn't have to be. Yeah. And we've been doing this long enough now to have had some, you know, seen some really brilliant people who've we've kind of lost, but I've also seen some people who are really brilliant who said, you know, this is the healthy thing for me and my family to decline. And, uh, and they've been at chef camp one year, not sober the next year, sober. And, uh, none of them regret it. Mm -hmm. And none of them. And I mean, we have alcohol at things. We also try to have sparkling waters and, you know, lots of other things because, you know, not everybody, not everybody is, is in that same space, but I'm really proud that, that you've done that. And, And even by you saying that, I think really encourages a lot of people to go, okay, so, you know, maybe that's a thing that, uh, that I should think about because that, you know, most people that have a problem deep down know they do, I think, but it's hard to go, hmm. What would it look like? So the grass is greener. You yeah. Know, you, you're going to feel a lot better, you know, yeah. and if it's for personal reasons, you know what those reasons are, are, yeah. you know, you can address it. So, all right. So uh, I've got two more questions. This will parlay in nicely. Jim, Jim, do you have a significant other or, or nah, girl? I'm, okay. I'm single. So is, are your parents alive? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I call your mom tonight and say, they just they just hauled Jim away. He's got the cuffs on. What does your mom <laughs> What does your mom think you did automatically? Uh, got caught smoking weed. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's what that's what Mama thinks. Yep, yep, yep. All right, Pat. Oh man, I think that's somewhere along the same lines. Like the only time I got in trouble was when I was a senior in high school, and my mom got angry yeah it's because i was smoking weed during high school hours <laughs> oh during like so, school hours yeah yeah it's a whole story so. we'll have to we'll have to come back the next year and get <laughs> get all that all right so final thoughts what what inspires you guys to to do what you do and to to grind and to create and to work with your teams and your your customers and guests to do what you do the only reason i'm where I'm at now is because of the feeling I remember of, of being in the kitchen with my grandmother and my my own mother and having somebody there to teach me right. what passion for food really was and why you did it or why they did it 100%. I think that's, that's something I eventually want to be able to pass on. That's me. Yeah, I think I loved like in the you know, the spoons after my mom got mm-hmm. done, you know, making the brownies or something like that. She would let me lick the bowl and the spatula after she got done painting it up, of course, you know, for all you health nuts. But, you know, nowadays it's getting a bunch of kids that are new in the industry that actually want to do good. And you can tell the ones that do and being able to teach them and the ones that are interested enough, like Jim, to that just looked bright eyed and bushy tailed at you <laughs> when you were talking about a certain ingredient or something and being able to, you know, and guide them through a service patiently uh, while not screaming to them, you know, for being too slow or something, but just still trying to teach them. You don't want to run people off. You always want to be patient. And I think teaching myself the patience to take the time and, and teach kids how to how to properly treat a seafood item or even a, you know, beef or pork or chicken or something like that. Yeah. It makes me feel good, mm-hmm. especially when they come to you and say, thank you for being patient with me or teaching me that. Isn't it something how rewarding it is to, to hear from somebody two, three, four years later, Hey, what you did meant a lot. I mean, how far does that go? When you're 25, uh, it was just another day in the park for me. But 
when you're 38 and you're kind of approaching the end of your career and you're kind of just, well, not the end of your career, but like, I was going to say, keep working a line. few more years. I mean, it, <laughs> but just he, like, he's working making line. so much. He's about to retire. I mean, what's look, going look, on here? I, I'm, I am a, a chaos freak. Like I love being stuck in the middle of it. You know, you showed me how to love the chaos. Shouting out to like, hey, you got two minutes on this or 30 seconds or whatever that or whatever it is. Just, you know, I need this now or I need it yesterday, you know, is a term that we use in the kitchen a lot is, you know, I need it now. Two or, minutes, chef. <laughs> and no, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you don't have a. If you don't have anything to say, just, I, I told him, I was like, dude, <laughs> yep. somebody told me way back in the day, just tell, just say two minutes. Because when he asks again, two minutes later, say two minutes. It's two just minutes, like shot. two minutes. Or if you have a better answer, go less than that. Right. But well, like, yeah, 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 of course. But, but like, yeah. I mean, because like, seriously, like seconds matter in mm-hmm. a kitchen. But if you can give a time limit on something like that, it gives leeway to the other stations on where we can time everything in and bottle, you know, and unfortunately bottleneck everything right. that release that table to the pass yeah. and get it out at the same time. Get That's what we're driving yeah. for. Which by the way, I just want to commend you guys. So there was quite a lot of chaos. I think there were 10 of y'all in, in one kitchen. There's one stove, one oven, two grills working downstairs. My boy, Jim Smith killed it. Jim did. Okay. Didn't he? He did. He did great. We, we all, I think we all, Jim was, he's a Jim. Get it? Oh, you, did a gems are, you gems are, are nuts. I think he was kind of like, Jim was kind of in between. And the beautiful thing with Jim doing all that for our, our listeners, you, you didn't get to see Jim, but Jim broke his, his regular glasses Shades. yesterday. Shades so was today great. he's wearing, well, and most of last night, he's he's walking around like Stevie Wonder. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? You, you wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Your glasses are broken. We've all been there in some form or fashion. With, I've had to do it in the kitchen before. And it's, oh, so it's rough. his future was so bright, he has to wear shades. And he wore shades like a boss today in the sun and in ever like everywhere and he went. still wearing them and now. And he's still got them on. <laughs> Downstairs, and, yeah. And hopefully next episode, uh, you guys will hear a little bit more from Jim Smith, former seafood king of Alabama. So... Pat, other Jim. I mean, both of you guys have a have a duplicate here. There's another Jim. There's another Pat, <laughs> Patrick. So I'm thanks. thankful that I'm not followed with Pat Pizza Pat. Seafood or Pat Automatic or <laughs> I was gonna. We we're going to Patomatic, but I, we didn't get to ooh, hang out much. So Patomatic is ooh, that's, that's good. That's catchy, that's, man. That's good. I, I told y'all I would do a nickname eventually, but you know, Pat and I didn't get to hang out very much. He's always in the back of the bus and. Kind of off to the side, looking, peering, observing, observing. I'm an and introvert, man. So, what, 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 what anyhow, can I say? so patomatic it is, and uh, I think you should change your Instagram handle. How can folks? <laughs> how can folks find you guys and what you're cooking and where you are that are listening to this right now? I'm at, on Instagram at, at Thompson Jim, and uh, I also work with another chef down in Orlando. His name is Sammy Odentala. We're with SMO Table. We're a private chef. Two private chefs just killing it down there man awesome i am patrick horn i'm at automatic seafood but my that's that's where i work my personal is chef all lowercase underscore lowercase p capital h as in like the scientific ph scale because i'm a nerd for yeah, scientific say nerd stuff like because it it matters and if you can't find him there, we're we're hoping he can be patomatic in the next two weeks. We're gonna have to <laughs> we'll see, see, see if that's we'll there. see. I'll have to so, check with Suzanne and Adam Evans about that. So there we go. I like it. All right. Well, thank you guys for being on the podcast. It's been great having you here at Ch- Eat Y'all Chef Camp. Well, thank Absolutely, you. Absolutely, dude. It's been it was a blast. A, it was a, it was a blast. You've been listening to the Eat Y'all podcast, hosted by Eat Y'all founder and chief relationship officer Andy Chapman. If you enjoyed this episode. It would mean the world to us if you'd join us in our mission to save family farms by subscribing and leaving a review. Even better, share this episode and follow us on your favorite social media account at Let's Eat Y'all 